Amen. Why don't we stand one more time and give a little stretch before we get into the word this morning? Amen. I want you to pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, speak to my heart, change my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How many know we worship, we serve a great God? Amen. We're going to look at Ephesians this morning. Uh, we were doing a study of Ephesians. We started it last week. Um, and as I told you before, I, want, I really felt I wanted to teach on the armor of God. But as I was beginning to read about it in chapter, the end here in chapter 6, it talks about, um, finally, my brethren, put on the whole armor of God. So if you see the word finally, that means there's a whole bunch of teaching that comes before that. Right? How many know if, 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 if your, your body's not fit, the armor won't fit? Okay? So you you got to prepare yourself. Um, and, and talking about Ephesians here... There's two things I want, to, I want to cover because as I was studying the book of Ephesians, I realized I could spend two years on it. I mean, I could spend, uh, every time I preach, I could just do one verse because there's so much deep stuff in the book of Ephesians. But basically, to sum it up, um, you'll have to study it a little deeper on your own, but to sum it up, it says, before the church is called to war, she is taught to walk. And before she is taught to walk, the church is taught where she stands. All right? You need to know where you stand in Christ in order to walk out the destiny that God has for you. Amen? And you cannot go to war if you don't know how to walk and you don't know how to stand. So there's a process of development that God brings us through as we go through the book of Ephesians. Okay? Uh, we, we learn about, um, in, in, in chapter 4, 1 to 16, the discipline of unity. How many know there needs to be unity in the church? Amen? Amen? We need to be disciplined in unity. We need to be disciplined in purity. Say purity. We need to be disciplined in forgiveness. Okay? We have to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Um, our relationships have to be in order. Okay? All of these things are covered in the book of Ephesians. Because true spiritual power flows from true obedience to the divine order of relationship and personal conduct. All right? And then finally, say finally, we get to the armor of God. And so we need to read uh, the whole letter. How many would start a letter and you just, you get a, le a letter from a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or wife and, and you read the very end without re reading the beginning, right? And this is what happens is a lot of people, they just want to read a portion of the book. I want to know how to fight, but you got to know how to stand first. Amen? You need to know your authority first. And so I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 1, just a quick overview of where we were last week. Um, and I want to say this, love is never on the, um, uh, it's not on the table for discussion, okay? God loves us. We're adopted into his family. And I shared last week how we were driving down the road, and my son said to me, he's 15, he said, Hey, Dad, in seven months, I can drive your car. And I almost went off the road. I like, and I just had a revelation. My son, now how many know I love my son? But I said to my son, you got to go through the driver's uh, ed program. You have to learn. You have to put so many hours with an instructor. And when you do all of these things, then I can trust you with my keys. Amen? And God is the same way. He loves us, but he's not going to trust us with his authority until we begin to go to the school of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? How many want to go to the school of the Spirit? Let God train you, build character, forgiveness, all of these things. So starting in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul speaking to the church, and he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. I'm just doing a bit of a re review from last week. So Paul is talking to a faithful church. He's talking to the saints in Ephesus. This is not a book that's written to a church that's really struggling morally like the Corinthians. Okay, This is a church that is rich in spiritual gifts. They're doing really well. They're a Galatian church. And it says here, or Gentile church, sorry, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessing. What? With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I want you to notice something when you study the Bible. You always have to look. Is it past tense? Is it present tense? Or is it future tense? How many know that's important? So is this past tense? Is it past tense? 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he was seated in heavenly places beside the right hand of the Father, right? So at that point, we were blessed with all spiritual blessing. The thing is we have to mature and get to a place where we can inherit and take what's rightfully ours. Amen? We have to be able to grow up in the school of the Spirit. So let's move on. Blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without him or without blame before him in love. We talked about that last week. It's not enough to be holy and without blame. You need to be in love with Jesus, right? We need to be rooted and planted in love. We have to be rooted and grounded in love. And out of that place flows holiness and blamelessness, okay? That's where we need to be. And what I want to talk about here. Verse 5, he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay? Now, here's the thing. He has predestined us to adoption. And most Christians never get past this. They see themselves as a servant of a God. How many know we are servants of God, right? They see themselves as a slave of God. How many know we are slaves to his mission but we're sons and daughters first and foremost amen Amen. and because we're sons and daughters we need to understand that god predestined this for us and when i use the predestined the word predestined does not suggest a fatalism that excludes some people while including others that's not what we're talking about when we talk about predestination it's not like okay okay in order for me to get glory you know I'm God, okay, you go to heaven, you're going to go to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to... And it wasn't preordained, you see, that's not the way God works. How many know that? But there was a plan that was predestined from before time. He made to abound towards us for for the redeemed. A guaranteed destiny for all of the redeemed. Guaranteed, if we'd walk this thing out. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him, say in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have forgiveness of sins. It's not of ourselves. It's not of our works, lest any man shall boast. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that saved me. It's the grace of God that saved you. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do. It's the grace. We are dependent on the grace of God. Say, I'm dependent dependent. on the grace of God. Okay, now grace, I hear it taught so many times. People say grace is God's unmerited favor. How many have heard that? There's some truth to that, but that's how the Hebrew word grace speaks of unmerited favor. When he's speaking to Abraham, he says unmerited favor. If you actually look at the Greek word for grace, okay, it actually means God's divine influence upon my heart. And we have to get this, church. This is so important. I wanted to get into this Ephesians much deeper. God says, no, you got to bring this to the people. They have to understand what grace is. Grace is God's divine influence upon your heart. And, and, And that is the difference between an Old Testament saint and a New Testament saint, is that in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon you to empower you to do the work of God. If you wanted to hear God for yourself, it was very hard, and you were reliant on the prophets to come and give you a word. But in the New Testament, it's different. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, I'm reading this one out of the New Living Translation. It says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I will give you a tender, responsive heart. And that's what happens at the point of salvation. Amen? We, we, the Spirit of God comes and he takes out the stubborn heart and he gives us a heart of flesh. What does this look like? Romans 5.5 5 tells us, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to who? To us. This is where it all starts, guys. All right? The grace abounds with all wisdom and understanding. 
to us. So God's, so, so what it's saying here is God's divine influence upon our heart, okay, abounds towards us in all wisdom and understanding. That's what it means. There's nothing mysterious about that. God is not mysterious. And this is a stronghold. This is a sacred cow that we're going to kill today, that God is mysterious and you can't know his ways. It's a sacred cow and it will destroy your walk with God. It will keep you from walking in victory if you have this idea that God is mysterious, okay? The Bible says he made his grace abound towards us in all wisdom and understanding, okay? Now, that word understanding means practical skill, comprehensive insight, enlightenment, and the right application of knowledge. That's what it is. God's divine influence upon my heart abounds to me to give me understanding so I can learn how to live life practically and have understanding about his will for my life. Amen? Amen. You know what the word mysterious means? It means difficult or impossible to understand. That's what it means. Difficult or impossible to explain. Difficult or impossible to identify. And this is a sacred cow in the church because people walk around going, well, the Lord's thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are higher than my ways. And so God works in mysterious ways. And what they do is they set themselves up for an attack and they don't realize that they're buying a lie. Because the spirit of God has in my heart and he's leading me. Amen. I'm going to show you a scripture. I'm going to give you an example of that. Because religious devils can twist God's word. Did you know that? Look at, look at this verse. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a good one. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. How many have heard Christians say that? They say... God is mysterious. The only thing that goes is a snake. Saints, we need to always read the verse before and the verse after. So we're going to do that. Can we do that together? We're going to read it actually together. Let's go to verse 7 and let's read it together. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Next verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Man is not merciful, and man does not abundantly pardon. And that's why God's thoughts and ways are different. But the enemy, take, people take that verse, and when something tragic happens... They lay it at the door of the Lord as if he's responsible. And if this sacred cow doesn't die in our lives, we're not able to move into our destiny as warriors in the kingdom. It's that simple. If you don't slay, the God moves in mysterious ways. Doctrine, you will be easy prey for the enemy. Last week I gave a little story. I'll give you this snap version of it. In ancient Egypt, they worshiped the god Baset. And a, god, a cat was actually the image of their god. And so because they, they idolized the cat, it was illegal to kill a cat or to strike an image of a cat. So they would guard these cats. Like in India, they, they guard the cow. So you can't hurt it. Punishable by death. And so there was an army. The, the, the Persians decided to go out against Egypt, and the, the king's name was King Cambius II, and he decided to invade. So what he did was he used cats against them. He had his soldiers running with holding cats, and they'd run into the city, and the Egyptians would not attack in case they kill the cat. And, and, and then the Persians, would, they would throw the cats into the, the ranks as the armies were coming forward, and they'd be so afraid of stepping on the cats, they would get defeated. And then the king says, I know what we're going to do. We're going to take our big shield, and we're going to paint a picture of a cat on it. So when they went to strike the shield of the enemy, they were like, I can't hit the cat. 
The cat is sacred. Right? And I believe very, I believe that um, people use scripture out of context. And it's written all over their shields. And they're afraid to strike the enemy because it could be God doing something in my life. Something to think about. Let's look at what the scripture says. Can we do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. But as it is written, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You know how many times I've heard that out of context? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and it, it, it is just... It's mumbo jumbo because the next verse says this. Let's read it. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So hold on a second. We do know what God is doing because he's revealing it to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the shallow things of God. Oh, sorry. The deep things of God. All right. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, one, so no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I'm telling you guys, you can know whether an attack coming against you is an illegal entry, the enemy just bombarding you, whether there's sin in your life that God wants you to deal with, or whether God's taking you through a trial, you can know by the Spirit. You don't have to walk around going, I don't know if God wants me here, if I'm supposed to be in this church, or I'm not sure, you know, if I'm raising my kids right, or I'm not sure if, you know, what he thinks or what my calling is. You don't have to walk in this mysterious realm because God wants you to know, and you can know by your Spirit. Isn't that good? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 goes even further. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we can declare what God declares. We can join our confession with God's confession. We can declare what God has to say about the situation. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. We can know what God's will is. And you might say, but I'm not sure what God wants for me. I'm not sure what God wants for me. Well, you know what the problem is? Most Christians, it's because you're not praying enough. You're not spending time with God. And there's a guy by the name of Jacob, and his brother was Esau. How many know the story? Esau is coming to visit Jacob. Jacob is terrified because his bro- he's, he's wronged his brother. And he, he meets a man, and it's the Lord. And the Bible says he wrestled with the angel. And he said, I will not let go until you bless me. And you know what? I, I believe as a church, we need to say, God, I will not let go until I know. I will pray and I will seek you, God, but I will know the will of my life for my life. I will know what you're asking of me. I will know how to raise my kids. I will know your plan and purpose. I will discern the times. I will. Why? Because I will not let go until I know because your spirit searches the deep things of God. And you know what? God loves that attitude. It's making a decision that I'm pressing into God. And if you're, if you're willing to press in to God and, and obey God, then he'll begin to reveal to you by his spirit the deep things of God. You don't have to walk around going, well, who knows? The Lord is mysterious. He works in mysterious ways. I don't know why Miss Susie died. We prayed for her, you know. You'll know. John 15, verse 15 says, No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard uh, from my father, I have made known to you. Isn't that good news? Jesus wants to share his heart with us. This is good. And of course, this is conditional upon abiding in his love and keeping his commandments. If you abide in the vine, if you abide in Christ, if you keep his commandments, if you love, then you should have a steady flow 
of knowing what God wants for your life. Can I hear an amen? This is, okay. Let's look at a few more scriptures just to give you more of an outline. John chapter 16, verse 13 to 15. Here's another one. Jesus says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Say all truth. Okay. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine, and he will declare it to you. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's taking what belongs to Jesus, and he's giving it to us. He's, he's taking what's in heaven, right? My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's taking from the heavenly realms, and he's bringing it into our lives, right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he will take of what is mine, and I'll, he will declare it to you. That's an amazing place to be, guys. If we would only believe God's word and say, God, if your word says it, I'm going to press in in prayer. I'm going to believe you, and I'm not going to stop, right? I'm not going to let go till I know. I'm not going to settle with just not having the answer. And I, I hate to bring this up again, because, but, but it's a good example. When, when our daughter was diagnosed with arthritis, and when the doctor says she will, her legs were all crooked and she couldn't walk, and the, and the doctor said she'll probably have to go to sick kids for all her life and you know, take medications, and she's going to have to struggle with all this. And, and then I talked to some Christians, and they said, well, you don't know what the Lord is working. I said, enough with that nonsense. I said, this is an attack of the enemy. And my wife and I got angry. And we went into prayer and fasting, and we praised God for seven days. And we said, we're pressing in until we see a breakthrough. And one day we woke up, and she was completely healed. The pain had gone. We went back to the doctors. Amen? And the doctor was, the, the, the doctor, I think, I don't know if it was a doctor or the nurse. She was, um, she was a Muslim, and she said, I said, listen, I'm, she says, I'll see you in a few weeks. I said, you won't see me because I believe in the power of prayer. This is our goodbye. She goes, well, I, I believe in prayer, too. I'm a Muslim. And I said, yeah, but you won't see me back here because Jesus heals. Amen? Amen? And I, I said, God, this is, and we went aggressively after in prayer. We, took, we didn't pray and say, God, please heal. We said, devil, get your stinking hands off of her because God doesn't want you to have her. And you know what? If I didn't know who I was in Christ, I would have just maybe prayed for a little while and then just said, well, the Lord is mysterious. Maybe he's going to do something good out of this. Amen? Amen? You need to know. Amen. You have to know. And you've got to have a spirit in you that says, I'm not going to let go until I know. If you're not sure what God is saying to you, get in the face of God and pray and say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. And I'm going to understand your will for my life. I'm going to understand what the situation is against me. And God will reveal it to you by his spirit. Amen? Amen? It's good. He'll tell you of things to come. He will take what belongs to Jesus and declare it to you. And I'm going to tell you something. With my children, you know, I remember Josiah I used to pick him up every night and say, Lord, I dedicate him to you and to your glory. Help me to raise him. And you know what? I, I remember having dreams. I would have a dream. I'd have a vivid dream of someone at school. Um, I won't give, give the details because he's probably sitting in here somewhere. But somebody in school did something very nasty to him or was trying to do something very nasty to him. And um, the Lord showed me the details. And the next day, I went to him and said, is this, I had a dream of this boy who was trying to hurt you in this way. Is this, yes, Daddy, this has been going on. And we were able to sit down and deal with it and address it. And he wouldn't have told me, but God showed me that the enemy was out to get him. And, 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 and that happened many times. And sometimes I'm just so busy, you know, serving God, preparing messages, doing whatever, that I had, you know, I had Deborah call me once. I don't know if she's in here, but she called me once in Kingston. And she said, I just had a, the, the Lord's been speaking to me. You need to deal with this situation. She told me and it was bang on. And it was like, okay, God, God is going to reveal what he wants for you. You have to realize God doesn't want to be mysterious. He wants to be known by you. He wants to reveal to you what's going on in your life. Amen? So, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We've obtained an inheritance. We're not just saved to go to heaven. We're saved because God wants to give us an inheritance 
an inheritance. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 to 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How many have had that bear witness? Let me see your hand here, okay? All right. If you haven't had that, we'll have an altar call. You can all come forward at the end, and we'll, we'll ask the Lord to come in, right? You can know in your spirit that you're a child of God. But here's the good news. It's not that you're just children. If you're, just, if you're a child, then you're an heir, an heir of God, and a joint heir with Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. So I want you to say, I'm an heir of Christ. An heir of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You actually know you're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. See, I'm a joint heir with Christ. That's better. And so... Um, Last week, we spoke of Paul's prayer to the Ephesians, and there was three things that he prayed for them. Number one was the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Number two, that their spiritual eyes would be open to know the hope of his calling and the inheritance in the saints. And number three is to know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. God's, God's power is so great. Amen? Amen? Uh, and that power is made available to us if we believe, right? If you don't believe, it's not available. You can just, if you don't believe that God's power is available to you, you can just put a Walkman headphone in or something and don't listen to anything else. But if you believe that God's power is available to you right now, there's places you can go in the Spirit, Amen. okay? And, and we want to follow on here. We're just going to read a bit out of Ephesians, Okay? Verse 20 to 23 says this, that power was working in Christ when God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. So he was seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things, say all things, under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. He's the head. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You might feel insignificant, but how many know you're part of the body? You say, well, I feel like a little toe. Well, a little toe is still over the head of Satan because we are his body. So it doesn't matter how you feel. God has declared, and if God's declared it, it's true. Our job is to believe it. Our job is to receive it. And you say, I can't. I, I can't get that. Don't let go to you. Don't let go to you. Till you know. That's what I'm looking for, the word no. Don't let go to you. No. Press into God. Get the word of God and say, God, I need to understand this. I need to know this, okay? Now, verse uh, chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which, in, in, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, which, which, which you once walked. We're not supposed to still be walking in sin. Did you know that? If, if you fall back and you make a mistake, there's mercy and grace, but you're not supposed to be walking in it. You're supposed to be striving to walk in holiness. Now look what it says here. You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as other people were. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were... Dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and he has raised us up together and made us to sit down in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so, um, give me a chair here, because I want to I wanna do a little example here. All right, Peter, you come sit here, brother. We'll just pretend there's another chair and Jesus is sitting there and the Father is sitting there, but here's Peter, okay? Now, the Bible says... God raised him up. So I'm going to stand here for a second, okay? Right here, okay. Actually, lay down. Lay down. That would be better. Lay down. Lay down. Just lay right down there. Make sure you know what you want to do. Uh, making up my mind as I go. Okay, here we go. 
So God raised you up together, right? Come on. When you get baptized, you get raised out of the waters, new life. I want you to sit here. All right. Now, Peter can say, I don't feel like sitting here. I don't feel worthy. So you try to get up. Try to get up. No, God says, you, I'm making you sit here. This is your place. You might want to get up. Go ahead. No, nope. God says, no, nope. you're sitting here. <laughs> this is where you belong. And we've got a whole bunch of people that are wrestling with God. They're seated in heavenly places with Christ in the realm of authority, in the realm of authority. And they don't even realize the authority they have. And God wants you to understand that you're, you're a, as Jesus is above all principality and power, so are you. You're seated in that place of authority. And God's going to make you sit there. Because you're his son and you're his daughter. And he wants you to know the inheritance that is available for you. That you can walk in victory. And what the devil does is he goes around and he takes this book. And he takes scriptures out of context and he throws them at you. And because most Christians don't take the time to study the word of God for themselves, they begin to build a library of dumb doctrines that are taken out of context. And we run around with these shields, with these false doctrines that keep us from winning the battle. And so today, I wanted to just... You can be seated. Thanks, brother. One of the prayers that Paul prayed, one of the three things he prayed for, he says... I pray that your spiritual eyes would be open so that you might know the hope of his calling, the inheritance that you have. And like I said last week, do you know why Paul had to talk to these mature Christians? They were mature Christians to a degree. He had to, do you know why he had to pray that they'd have understanding? Because they didn't have it. And so we need to be willing to say, God, I'm humble before you. I want everything you have for me. I want my eyes opened. I want to be able to discern what you're doing because God does not want to be a mystery. He doesn't. And you can, you, can, you can tell me till you're blue in the face that God is mysterious and he does things. God wants you to know. He'll tell you. Now, in saying that, are there things that are a mystery? Of course there are. Like Paul talks about, you know, Christ in the church being married and how it's a mystery. Yes, that's a mystery. There's things that I've prayed for people that have died, and that's a mystery to me because I, I, when I get to heaven, I have questions. But concerning God's will and his purpose and my authority and what I'm here for, there's no mystery. God has made it known to us by his spirit. Amen? That was the balance I brought at the end. Are you like that? So let's stand together, and I want to pray this morning. Don, would you be able to just go on the acoustic and just lead a song, um, if you're comfortable with that? Maybe you're a good, good father, whatever you feel to, to do. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I thank you, Lord, that it's able to pierce into the, even to, there's no creature hidden from your sight, O oh God. There's no enemy that can come against the work of God in our lives. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. God, you want your people to know that you're not a mystery. God, that you are speaking to our hearts. And if we're not hearing it, we need to not let go till we know. We need to press into God. And we need to say, God, I want to know your will. I want to know your ways. And I just feel to say this, if some of you are, God is calling you to maybe start, maybe you need to fast, you need to pray, because there's been something you've been struggling with for even a few years, and just, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this situation. God is saying today, he wants you to know, and he'll reveal it to you. Just press in. I don't know why God plays on hide and seek, but he wants to see if you're going to go after him or run back to your old ways. And I'm going after God. Amen? God is faithful. Hallelujah. If you're in this place and you just really feel I have to, well, first of all, if you've never made a decision to serve Jesus Christ, you've never given your heart to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Jesus actually marched up Golgotha, not marched. He crawled up with a cross on his back and hung naked as a public spectacle for you and for me. 
It's not too much if God would say, would you come to the front and make a decision publicly that you want to serve me? So just a few minutes, I'm going to ask, if, if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just lift up your hand right now. We're going to pray with you, and God's going to make himself known to you. Is anybody in this place? Everybody's saved? Okay. And if you're in this place and you just have really been struggling with your identity, you've believed the lie, You've believed the lie that, you know, God's a mystery and that I can't figure him out. I want you to just lift your hand. I want to pray with you today. Nobody here? Okay. Okay. That's awesome. God will bless you for that. Just lift your hand if that's you and you say, I want to get past this mystery thing. I want to be known by God. Amen. Just pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're not a mystery. You have made known your will and your plan for my life. And I ask God that I'd have eyes to see. Lord, if I have to wrestle with you a bit, I will, but I know you want to show me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen.